Northampton. You might remember Brother Nagy as a member of the Pearl the West Masonic Lodge Number 146 in Newport Ritchie, Florida. He's also a part of the Florida Lodge of Research, a 32nd degree Mason, 2014 recipient of the Dwayne E. Anderson Award for Excellence in Masonic Education, and of course, the author of the Building Better, Be- Better, Building Better Builders series of uncommon, um, uncommon Masonic education books in the Crash. Uh, un- the masking, <laughs> the craft unmasked, the uncommon origins of Freemasonry and its practices. Whew, that is uh, quite the. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly half-hour program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, Editor-in-Chief of CraftsmanOnline.com. And back on our Building Better Builder series is Brother John S. Nagy. Welcome back, Brother Nagy. It's good to be here, Brother Michael. Thanks for having me. If there is a question you have had about anything in our beloved craft, chances are Brother Nagy has either written a book or a thought piece on it. (laughs) And this whole episode came from just a question that I asked him about the origins of Freemasonry. And I'm glad you're here to give us this researcher's perspective of it. So should we... Should we start first with the very distinct warning that you usually give in presentations or in the book? This book will challenge your preconceived notions. It will upset you. It will make you very, very perturbed. That is not what it is intended to do. It is intended to share relevant light, real light. Please suspend any kind of conclusions till after you have gone through the entire book first, because as I share the information, uh, I will tell you, even the people who were reviewing the book before I published it were saying at first, I was absolutely blown away. Secondly, I was disturbed. Third, I was upset. No sooner did I get upset, I read a little bit more and I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so the upset went away and then they they got read a little bit more information. They got upset again, and then they read a little bit more information. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Do you think it's because we're told one thing at the end of the third degree, and maybe some of us come into the craft with ideas of our own of what we believe Freemasonry to be, and then we're told at the end of the third degree, like, this is the story of Freemasonry. And then you start reading some of the books and the origins on it, and as we talked about, you know, having that that faith of ours being challenged and the acceptance of it, it makes us uncomfortable. It can make us angry. We're told a lot of information before we join. That is the profane understanding of what it is that we are. And then you read some books and, and you go down that rabbit hole. And these books were written by individuals who had their own preconceived notions. So by the time you open the door, walk through and basically get hit, in the face with the information, literally, (laughs) you have some preconceived notions of your own based on what you were told during the three degrees. The warning that I would place on anybody joining the craft is if you don't understand the word symbolic, you really need to tunnel down that rabble hole because the entire three degrees are referred to as a blue lodge as the craft lodge, but most importantly, the symbolic lodge. And it's it's called that for a extremely good reason, because everything that is shared with you within those three degrees is symbolic. Even a thing that you ha- believe that you have to take literally, no, it's symbolic. And if you don't understand what symbolic means, you're going to be misleading yourself into embracing things as if they are literal. In our society, we have an entire generation of individuals who have absolutely no understanding of what symbolic means. They have no understanding of allegory. And as a result, they come in and they take things literally. And so when I point these things out within the book and and show the symbolic meaning behind things and show what's really going on, because we're human and we go through these degrees and we take things for granted um, when we're actually 
when the veil is ripped off, uh, so is the Band-Aid, <laughs> and it hurts. It hurts a lot sometimes. Well, I feel like we did our due diligence, so if you're easily offended and you don't want to hear, <laughs> thanks for coming along this far. <laughs> I remember where I first was when the idea of what I had been told Freemasonry was, was challenged. And I was reading John Robinson's book. I feel like we've talked about this a lot uh, on the Craftsman Online podcast, Born in Blood. And that was the first time that I was like, wait a second, you're telling me that Masonry didn't come from the stone craft, the stone cutters lodges that I've you know heard so much about over time. Um, and, and that's when I started to have my thoughts challenged on things. It, Obviously, Robinson refutes the idea that Freemasonry is the descendant of the Stonemasons' guilds and kind of lines things up more up to the Knights Templar. Yes, he does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to give the spoiler alert to that book. <laughs> You came to Masonry from a different perspective. I feel, you know, a lot of men that I know, they come to Masonry and the esoteric aspects are introduced to their life thanks to the craft. But you came in with more of a background of that. So I I'm interested to hear where your origin story was first challenged. I think it was when I started investigating some of the words that we used within the craft lodge. One of them stood out like a sore thumb, Cowan. As I went down that rabbit hole, looking at the actual root of the word, the origin, and what I found out what it actually referred to in its origin, and how that particular word was used within many, many different documents in literal stonecraft lodges, calling them members. Um, and and I've, there's documents all over the place referring to members as Cowans, and, and these were legitimate craft members, part of the craft lodge, Stonecraft Lodge. And then what we find is that later on, they were actual members of speculative lodges, too. Mm -hmm. So where did this word creep in? And, and what I find is that somebody found an old document uh, in some, I think there was two providences where Cow there was a war with Cowans, and so therefore they sewed that into our law uh, lore, and they made it so that oh we're supposed to keep Cowans out because this, and they they had some very very superficial justification for keeping them out, and what they don't realize is that Cowans were part of the craft, and it's a symbolic lodge, so you have to look at not the fact that they were kept out or some of them actually were in. But what actually is a Cowan? And a Cowan is somebody who just doesn't build with the cement of brotherly love and affection, and they don't square their work. Hmm. Why would you want them coming into the lodge if they're going to build with their brothers without love? And they're not going to refine their work to the point where it fits snug. Do you take Cowans to be a negative thing? Because just by that description, I think of Cowans as kind of maybe sloppy, unkept below average they they have their purpose and we have them in our lodges and they do just exactly what it is that they're willing to do and they are great supports but just don't expect them to square their work mm. and don't expect them to 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 build with more love than you would expect from the the brothers who do right right they have a certain understanding of the craft and they will do certain jobs within the craft just don't expect more uh, from them than they're willing to give hmm. and we have we have quite a few and and god bless them we need them without them the, the craft actually would fall apart however we're back to you know the literal hmm. versus the symbolic and the symbolic is well why would you want to have anybody coming into the lodge that doesn't build with love and doesn't swear their work just the, hearing that definition of cowan because it's never really at least in my experience been fully explained as to what a cowan is except we hear it you know usually tied together cowans and eavesdroppers so we think of people that are trying to unlawfully gain masonic information or access to a lodge like somebody that you'd want to keep away at least an arm's length away because they don't deserve to be here it's interesting to hear your definition of it again getting away from the literal to or the symbolic to the word usage of it where you're like okay i can think now a cowan is a brother that maybe with a little bit more support as you mentioned or foundation or work from the other brothers we could help him in his work to write his work and and be on the path to a more perfect ashlar they're not bad men. They're just individuals who don't want to do specific work on themselves. And God bless them. Uh, they still want to support. They still want to get together. They still want to hobnob. 
and they are extremely good at supporting, but just don't expect more from them than, you know, right. they're willing to give. I always think of Callens as like the uh, the old timey villain that, you know, throws the cape over his his face and is uh, is, is basically a villain of the craft. But but they're not. They're not. The, the idea is it's a symbolic lodge. So what do Callens symbolically represent? And these are individuals if effectively that you don't want to bring into your own lives because they're individuals who don't build with love and they don't square their work. And if you are into refining and, and building a business or building a life or building relationships, you, you can't depend on them for anything other than what they actually are providing. And if you expect more, please don't. Mm. That investigation of that one simple word and finding out what it is that I found out about it uh, led me to look at other words like the word free. I will tell you that when I went down that rabbit hole and found out what the word actually meant, right. uh, it rocked my world. And I started looking at, OK, well, what else is within Freemasonry are we told? Because we're told free and accepted. And this is not universal, but I can tell you that I have brought it up enough to know that it's widespread amongst many jurisdictions that there's an understanding that the word free or shall I say the term free and accepted means operative and speculative Mason free being operative accepted being speculative. And my investigation basically found that that's not only wrong, <laughs> it covers up what it actually meant to communicate initially early on. And we have entire generations of men being told false information. So that led me to say, what else about Freemasonry are we being told by basically brothers that don't know any better? And so I started tunneling down that rabbit hole even further. And I, I came across the word mastery. And I said, well, I'm going to look up mastery. I mean, it's I have some time this evening. Let me go down that rabbit hole. And when I found out that the word mastery and mystery actually were synonymous at one point in the semantic uh, history between the two, hmm. I recognized that uh, there's more to this than meets the eye. You know, from the, the investigation of free and accepted, which I actually published a, a research book on that called Building Free Men, that laid the foundation for the craft unmasked because a rabbit hole I chased on mystery versus mastery led me to understand. And this one little clause in the, it was a footnote in the bottom of a, you know, back page, mystery and mastery were universally synonymous and only in the way that mystery uh, is used in only one little clue that gave a background to the two being synonymous that's in mystery plays. And I said, mystery plays. Ooh. What's what's that? So what I did was I, I put that little, little baby on the side and I said, OK, I'll investigate that after I get done with this building free man book. <laughs> and I started investigating and found out that the mystery schools were actually occupational schools in the medieval times. And they put on mystery plays, which were basically mystery was an occupation. They put on occupational plays uh, based on their guild. You had guilds all over the place putting on different mystery plays or mastery plays. Mm. Our Stonecraft brothers were no less involved, according according to what I've come across. People are probably hearing this and going, plays? Like that it almost takes out some of the significance or the educational opportunity that would be there. But you have to understand that back in like the 17, 16, 1500s, 1400s, um, they didn't have the, uh, you know, HR training videos that we've all had to sit and watch at work that putting on a play was was how they communicated. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't know how to read. They didn't have uh, HBO. They didn't have television. They didn't have radio. The only way that they educated the Catholic Church referred to as the ignorant masses were these morality plays. And they were called saint plays, morality plays, mystery plays. They were all based on trying to basically communicate morals to the, the populace. And the guilds were involved in that. They, they took up the banner when the church uh, pulled a plug on it, and they started doing these productions. And, of course, they had their own marketing and advertisement inserted into their plays and it was a way for them to market their wares and, and their services. Mm. They used allegory coming out the wazoo. 
And oh, lo and behold, what are we doing in Freemasonry? We have morality plays using allegory, right? Communicating moral themes for moral purpose, uh, communicating in such a way that we educate the individuals, the patrons who come through our process. I think it's fair to say across every jurisdiction, when it comes to um, being showing or displaying your proficiency, there is memorization that goes into place. We've talked about that before, you know, the parenting, the roboting. But what you're really hoping for is that, you know, the brother absorbs it and is able to repeat it back with the knowledge and the the passion of understanding it. And it's it's compelled him to live a better life. The, the morality lesson is really sunk in. But that was one thing that I found interesting about Freemasonry was once you go through the degrees and you become a master mason, and and even not, if you're able to in your jurisdiction to be there for the opening and closing of the lodge and see that quote unquote performance, that's a little mini play within itself. There's a lot of plays, as you mentioned, that happen in our rituals. So did you start to connect, you know, the the theater aspect, the production aspect in Freemasonry with the times? What I concluded is that I I started evaluating the craft after a while. I'm a business coach and I'm trained. uh, I have a master's in engineering management and I was taught in the industrial engineering college, how to go into an organization and evaluate it open-mindedly unbiased and take a good look at what they are doing match it up against what they say they're doing, compare the notes, make sure there's integrity, and then start t- taking a look at where improvement can occur. So what I did was I rolled up my sleeves and I put my profession to work and I evaluated the lore versus actual history, what we say we do as opposed to what we actually are doing. And as you had said, you know, proficiencies, you know, we're, we're learning scripts. Mouth to ear, the old style, basically the the best way to learn how to communicate a play is to learn the script. And so what we do is we have three different scripts at three different levels so that as a candidate comes through, what they can do is they can learn these scripts and they can plug and play into the organization fairly quickly. Because once they understand the scripts, what shall I say, once they've memorized the scripts, they don't have to understand it. Uh, they can actually join in on the fun of making good men better. Or basically another way of saying that is making more members. Mm. They've been made a member. They learn the script of how to make members. They plug and play. They make more members. And they don't have to understand. That is, I think, one of our greatest shortfallings as an organization. There have been a lot of efforts of uh, from jurisdictions to explain the symbolism and the relevance. And they do a fairly good job of a superficial education in explaining it. However, the problem is the people who are explaining it themselves are reaching it for straws many times. They themselves don't understand the relevance of what is being communicated by the scripts. Uh, The scripts were put together over many, many generations. They were added to as much as we want to say that there's been no innovation God bless us. We have invigorated the process at every twist and turn. And what we started out with as an organization 300 plus years ago, we don't have today. And they've been modified. They've been squished through a sieve at times. They're they're nothing like what it is that we had originally. Uh, They had the moralization of the working tools that were added uh, early on and then moralized later on. Uh, the perfect Ashler only first appeared uh, when the merger of those two warring Grand Lodges come together to create the uh, United Grand Lodge of England. And bingo, all of a sudden we've got a perfect Ashler. Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. And uh, actually it was the Perpend Ashler initially. And anybody who knows any of the history, they are considered synonymous because there's no way the description of the perfect Ashley would be ever used in any building. It's, it's useless as a perfect square, a perfect cube. They don't use that in building. Uh, the smooth surface wouldn't hold the cement. And the only place you could ever put even a rough smooth Ashler, a rough uh, cube like that formation is an, as cornerstones. We got generation after generation. They just simply don't understand what we're really doing. And back to the proficiencies. Good God, it'd be very nice to have people understand what it is that they're learning. But 
most lodges don't take the time to really do anything other than superficial explanations and the explanations that are given are what were given to them. What tends to happen, and this is, you know, I'm sure you've heard this complaint many a time as well, is, you know, a, a brother, go, a man comes to a, a lodge interested in joining Freemasonry. Hopefully he's not given a petition on the first night that he visits to join the lodge. Hopefully they, you know, have him visit a few times so they can make sure that this is right for him. Uh, but eventually he does, and he goes through all the paperwork, and then he takes that first degree, and then he spends a significant amount of time, hopefully again, going through the proficiency to eventually become a master mason and then myself personally after investing about a year in going through the three degrees you come to your first meeting and you find out we're going to have discussions about the roof and all of the wonderful esoteric or historical or dramas or plays as you had said that you had seen previously in the degrees in the meetings you were able to attend don't happen <laughs> at the regular lodge meetings and you wonder what's going on here. So hopefully some of those brothers get into being a part of the degree team and, you know, focusing on that. But my question for you is, you know, how should we, and, and mainly should we start setting expectation levels or explaining to new members, the difference between the degree ritual of Freemasonry and the, Masonic education that can come after the degrees are conferred. Oh, I've got uh, something in the end of uh, uh, end of I think uh, the craft unmasked where I I say this is something that every candidate ought to know, and that uh, you're installing roadmaps in your head and hopefully in your heart, and the roadmaps are the degrees. And if you remember verbatim what it is that each line that is handed to you that you are asked to memorize uh, their codes, their codes to help you focus on working toward improving yourself as a man. It should be enough to tell a man what to do. If he is a man and he understands the relevance of what it is that he must be doing, he'll do it. He doesn't need any coaxing. He doesn't need any prodding. He's not going to be um, supported in any other way than to be told, just do it. If you come in to embrace what it is required to become a better man and you come in and you're a good man when you hear that if you come in with the intent of becoming better then the script will be evaluated for clues as to okay you know where does it in the script tell me i can improve myself and you know the first degree as the uh, as i had indicated there are a whole bunch of tools that you could, that are you you are introduced to at just the under apprentice level. That if you take them in hand, understand what they're supposed to be used for, or how they are to be developed in your life, you can improve leaps and bounds. But if you are not an individual who works on self improvement and you need coaching, chances are it's going to be dragging you, kicking and screaming if you're asked to do it. But if you are driven to do it, you're going to basically say, don't get in my way. I've got something to do and I need to work on myself. And therefore, you know, unless you can help me work on myself, don't distract me. You become a superfluity and possibly even a vice harmful to me. I feel like we did so much build up at the beginning. And, and I felt this way when I watched your presentation on um, the craft unmasked, the uncommon origin of Freemasonry and its practices where, you know, you tune in and there's all these brothers that are in this room and, and a Zoom meeting. And it's like, OK, you know, Brother John's going to give this presentation. It's like, you know, almost flashing lights, like warning, warning. And what what I found refreshing after you finished the presentation and got to the questions and asked uh, questions was you were actually asked questions that weren't challenging your research or this these new ideas, that, but mainly questions of brothers that were kind of reaffirming and almost felt reassured that you had laid this out, that there was always speculation of some of these things. I'm just curious that, you know, what is some of the feedback that you've heard from other brothers in other presentations or from folks that have read your book based on this research that you've laid out? Most all of the feedback that I get from people who actually take time to read this book all the way through is, wow, I've heard, I've actually come across 12 other theories before this one. And, you know, when I heard them say 12 other theories, I'm saying to myself, <laughs> well, I really wasn't writing a theoretical book. 
I was writing a book describing what I saw and, and basically putting a description on what I saw and labeling it based on the description. When I started hearing this thing referring to my book as a 13th theory, I said, oh my God, is that what I did? Did I put a theory out there? Because, you know, as an engineering management professional, uh, I did evaluate and I actually put down my findings. And my findings basically said we are totally immersive, arena style, role playing theatrical society with a moral purpose. And I go on to say, and when you think about it, so are a lot of other organizations, if they want to be honest, institutions, even workplaces where all role playing were asked to embrace some principles and abide by them and stick to it. And we've got a script that we've got to follow. And in our case, as an organization, the basic premise is betterment. And not only is it betterment, but we take it on good authority that the individual who is coming through is morally good. And the only way to make a morally good person better is to improve their morality. And so how do you go about doing that? Well, you don't coerce them. You don't threaten them. You basically point the way and say, all right, if you're a man of your word, you're going to be true to your word. By gosh, here's the script that you've got to follow in order for you to better who you are. And the, 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 the biggest problem is when you start to think about the fact that, yes, we're given scripts. Yes, we're told the directions we need to follow. And we are role playing. Uh, I mean, literally throughout our entire ritual, we're pointing out that in the character of and uh, you are now an actor of. And it's not like we're not saying it in ritual we're, we're we say it in, in six or seven different places, literally blatantly, that we are playing a role. It's no small surprise that when I put that out there, I hear brothers saying, well, yeah, come to think of it. You know, I, I guess you're right. If just, yeah, you can argue and say, oh, no, there's more. Well, uh, yes, brother Michael, there is much, much more, but you have to embrace the role in order for you to get it. Maybe it kind of it's kind of hurtful to to admit at first, but once you embrace it and recognize, no, no, we're we're playing a role. I I have embraced the role of a speculative mason and I play the part to the best of my ability. Yes, I mess up, but I get back on script as soon as I find out. When you're no longer playing it inauthentically, where you become the very thing that you are trying to portray. You become the master's word. You literally become the very thing that you seek. And once you become authentically the role that you're playing, uh, life gets better. The book is The Craft Unmasked, The Uncommon Origin of Freemasonry and Its Practices. The author, Brother John S. Nagy, and you can get your copy at coach.net. That's coach dot and the word net. Thank you very much for again coming on this episode of Craftsman Online, Brother Nagy. Thank you for having me, Brother Michael. It's an honor and a privilege. If Masonic education is important to you, you can sign up for our emails newsletter at craftsmanonline.com. A reminder that new episodes of the Craftsman Online podcast are available for download Monday mornings. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Thank you.